Hello, and welcome to today's Medical Center Library Workshop. My name is Stephanie Henderson, and I'm one of the librarians that works in the Medical Center Library. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. You can also unmute your mic and ask any questions as well. We will be recording today's session, so I just wanted to let you know that. So for today's agenda, we're going to discuss the differences between review types and explore the ways in which medical librarians can assist you with the different reviews that you may be doing. We do have some upcoming workshops related to this one. You can also view the full listing at our website. It's um, on the slide here. Wednesday, October 14th, we have an introduction to systematic review. And then Tuesday, October 27th, we have translating searches for systematic review. <clears throat> and then on Friday, December 4th, we have the new PubMed for systematic review. And then the link for our guide is right here. <clears throat> So you might wonder why why are we doing this workshop? You all know what um, literature searches are and um, <clears throat> literature reviews are. So we have um, you know one of the reasons that we're doing this workshop is because you know we've seen an increase in the number of requests for systematic reviews in the medical center library and. Um, Systematic reviews require a lot of time and planning. And we kind of notice is this difference in terminology that um, people are using. So when they say, when someone comes in and says, I want to do a systematic review, and we kind of talk to them a little bit about what a systematic review is and what it entails, then they they realize, no, no, <laughs> this is not what I want. I want a just a literature search or um, I want to write a review, but I want it to be system systematic and the planning and the description um, and, the, and the way that it's searched and the way the databases are searched. So then we kind of realized that we're not all on the same page as far as terminology goes. So what we want to do today is get everybody back on the same page and um, realize like help you all help everyone realize that we do have um, some tools and resources available for you in the Med Center Library um, and in the UK libraries to help you clarify and make determinations of what kind of reviews that you want to undertake. So that's kind of the goal or so kind of the background information um, about why we're doing this workshop. So one thing that you might ask is, you know, what do what does this medical center library offer? What services do you have? So we do have a literature search service. So faculty, staff, residents um, will perform the searches for you if you just send us a request. And then graduate and undergraduate students, we typically lean more towards teaching the process. We are not going to do the work for you, especially if it's for an assignment. Um, but we will teach you the process, recommend databases and search strategies for um, doing a literature search. And then the, we also have a systematic review service. So we um, teach the process to students, residents, and faculty. We consult and advise on the process and tools. Um, you know, sometimes people come in and they say, I want to do a systematic review, but it, their question lends itself to a scoping review or maybe a rapid review. And so there's many types of reviews, review types that we're gonna go into a little bit later. Um, and so that we can consult with you and tell you here's the best, um, the best review type for you, for your question, here's some tools that we have, um, you know, textbooks, um, you know, your prisoner statement and protocols. And so we can advise you on that whole process. And with the literature search, um, we do have you know, several databases that we subscribe to. We have EndNote for like the management of the data. And so we can um, advise on that as well. And then the other option is for us to be a review team member. 
and that would require co-authorship. So we actually would do the literature search for the systematic review for you or whatever review prep you're doing. Um, we would, you know, um, get all the data into EndNote and extract it and we would um, follow the protocols and write the methodology. So all of those things would be a more substantial um, amount of work on our part. And um, so that would definitely um, be, would um, <laughs> lend itself to co-authorship. So just talk about that a little bit. So now what I want to do is kind of um, this, go over this chart right here. So we have, what is a systematic review? What's a literature or narrative review? It's common to confuse systematic and literature reviews as both reviews are used to provide a summary of the existing literature um, or research on a specific topic. But even with this common ground, both review types are very different. Um, systematic reviews are often compared to traditional reviews um, however, narrative review articles typically don't use explicit or systematic approaches in the review process, and they're more subjective. Subjective, sorry. <laughs> in a narrative review, such strategies are not described. Um, reasons for inclusion and exclusion of the studies are often not specified. Critical appraisal is not done, and methods for synthesizing the evidence are not clearly stated. Transparency is missing. Um, consequently, narrative reviews are more biased and they have a higher likelihood for inaccurate or unsubstantiated conclusions. So systematic review really extends beyond the findings of a traditional literature review by employing a rigorous research method to extract the data from studies that have been assessed for their quality and then combining the findings into a set of recommendations. So a synthesis statement can also be used to represent the findings of a systematic review, um, in which extremely it's extremely valuable for the, that business practitioner that um, likely it's going to reduce the lag time for getting new evidence into practice. So again, we're talking about um, when we think about evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice, and we think of systematic reviews or Often at the top of the, they are at the top of the pyramid, and that's really the gold standard. And lots of times practitioners read these systematic reviews um, because they want to know what is, you know, am I doing, like, is there new evidence that would support changing the way that I um, care for a patient? You know, they're, it's really it's about um, changing care practices. So we want to make sure that systematic reviews are quality and um, are transparent and that they are not full of bias. So we really want um, those systematic reviews to be done appropriately. So one of the major differences between a systematic review and a traditional literature review is that the systematic review is guided by a protocol. We'll talk a little bit more about protocols a little bit later. But the protocol serves as a blueprint to clearly and succinctly describe how the review is done and why it is important um, that the review be done, what are the methods used to conduct the review, and how will the findings of the review, how are they going to be used. I also want to point out on the chart um, the number of authors on the timeline, these two areas. So in a systematic review, it's typically three or more people. And then in a literature or narrative review, it's typically one or more. In a systematic review, they take months to years. The average is about 18 months. This shocks a lot of people when they um, when we talk to um, when we talk to them about how long a systematic review takes, it takes a lot longer than you would expect. Um, and then literature reviews can you know be done in weeks to months. So types of reviews, there is a, um, a chart on our systematic review guide that I'm going to be going over with you in more in depth. And it's really based upon this article, a topology of reviews and analysis of 14 review types and their associated methodology. So this article was um, written by Booth and it was done in 2009. 
it, what it did is it looked through the stats and through the literature to come up with about 14 different review types. And it talks about the methodologies associated with them. So this was a kind of key piece in the field and it really guided how a lot of people looked at reviews since then. The authors did a update of that review. Um, it's over here. They did it in 2019, the link right here. Um, we'll send out those slides to, to these a little bit later. Um, so you'll have them and we'll post that on the recording slide as well. <clears throat> so they did a broad searches of these, um, see what kinds of reviews people are doing in the field and they identified it 48 different review types. And they grouped those into seven different families. So really there's a review type for any kind of question that you might have. Um, and again, you can, this is the basis, this 14 reviews is the basis for the chart that I'll be going over. But if you would like to learn more about the review types and the families, you can read this 2009 update, 2019 update. So, um, our systematic review guide, I'm going to actually go out to the internet live and show you how to get there. This is the chart, um, the screenshot of the chart. It's really, um, it's really helpful. <laughs> so, um, and especially when you don't know a lot about systematic reviews and you're trying to decide what, you know, you have a question that yet it doesn't lend itself to a systematic review. So that's where this kind of, um, this chart will help you be able to determine which, which one you should do. All right, so let me um, stop sharing for a second and then go on out to I got those. <laughs> okay, now we should be at the right spot. So if you go to the Medical Center Library, you can um, get to the systematic review guide a couple different ways. You can click on this research guide and just type in systematic reviews, or you can go down here um, to guides, and it's listed systematic reviews right here. That's where I'm going to go. And then, um, before we go to the review chart, um, the types of reviews chart, I'm going to just kind of give you an overview of what is in this guide. So um, this is a definition of what is a systematic review, um, how can the medical center library help. This is where you can request a systematic review consult, or you can also click this button over here. This goes to the same form. And once you click on the form, We'll want to know a little bit of information about you. What is your question? What you know databases have you searched so far? Um, what some articles that you think would be included in it, your review? And just some other questions for you. So what this does is this helps us get on the same page so that we're um, that will make the consult more productive. <clears throat> so we don't want to. We want to get as much information from you as possible so that we can really start to help you um, in that process. And so then um, what to know before you start, just some tips here for you. We'll go over this um, chart as well. What type of review is right for you? We're going to talk about that one. And then just a basic um, timeline for a systematic review. Again, months, <laughs> months and years, not weeks and months. And then um, we're going to go over this one. It just tells you the types of reviews. We have some books here for conducting systematic reviews. And like um, we have one on searching bigger literature. And this systematic review step, this one is really important. It um, discusses um, all the steps in the systematic review process. And we have guidelines and standards linked here for you um, as well. So develop a research question, create a protocol, literature searching, um, study selection, you know, reporting the results, everything is right there. And so we have uh, some documents linked here 
for you. We have a few templates um, here as well. So there's a lot of good information here. And then finding existing systematic reviews. So once you're, um, you know, you don't want to ever start a systematic review without finding out if there's already been one done. So there's some tools here for how you can find that information. We have some data management um, a table on data management here as well. Um, so it's kind of some software that is provided and it will tell you if it's free or if it costs money. And we also have um, some systematic review tutorials. So I just want to kind of give you an overview of this, um, this guide because we do have a lot of information in here. So we want to um, make sure that that gets known. All right, so let's go to this types of reviews. So again, this is based on the 2009 Booth article that was 14 review types. So we've already kind of, I'm not going to talk about every single one, but um, we've already talked about literature reviews. Um, so we've already discussed that one and we've already kind of discussed um, systematic reviews. So let's go um, up at the top here. So mixed methods reviews. So this is one that we get a lot. Um, people ask a lot about this, um, this type of review. And so mixed methods review summarizes the findings from a study with diverse designs. So qualitative, contextual, economic, quantitative, observational, experimental, and mixed methods to better understand the complex interventions, programs, and phenomena. So it really asks what does qualitative and quantitative evidence tell us about. It is premised on the belief that a single method review provides only half of the information needed to care for patients or to make healthcare decisions in real world situations. It combines con contextual data that captures the human experience and allows the voice of the client or the provider to be heard, along with numerical data on the effectiveness, um, on the evidence effectiveness. So then we, um, and you can kind of see, um, it requires either a very sensitive search to retrieve all of the studies or a separately conceived search um, to get quantitative and qualitative strategies. So you kind of search a little bit different for every type of, every single one of these review types. So for example, like a rapid review, we're seeing rapid reviews um, right now, like on COVID, because it's a current, um, there's a lot of uh, literature out there on COVID, and so there's enough for these systematic reviews to be done, but because they can take up to a year to be done, that's not, you know, right now, that is too much of an emerging situation, and we really need it to be done quickly. So again, it's a type of um, knowledge synthesis in which components of the systematic review process are simplified or omitted to produce information in a short amount of time. <clears throat> So one of so we can kind of um, look to rapid reviews to to guide um, like following these parameters. So in a systematic review, you would typically search a lot of databases, but so maybe fewer databases are searched for a rapid review, and often only one is searched. Um, so the use of gray literature is not used at all, or it's very limited. <clears throat> There's usually a restriction on the types of studies, like you know, most recent five years, or only systematic reviews, or English only. It's limited to the inclusion of full text, and abstracts are acceptable. Um, it's limited to dual review for study selection. The data is extracted. Um, data extraction is limited to the basic information that is necessary to provide information for decision making. Um, there's no limited or grading re of recommendations. There's limited evidence synthesis, and the results are often provided as a list. And then only minimal um, conclusions and recommendations are provided. It's, kind of, it's definitely like COVID would be a great example of you know, a rapid review. So then scoping reviews are, um, they're defined, when you do a scoping review, you're looking at a very broad, um, a panoramic view of a topic. 
Um, that's what's used to develop the research question or the protocol. And, and we'll talk about scoping reviews a little bit more um, later in the presentation, and I'll kind of give you some of an example of this of, of our research question for a scoping review. Again, they're very broad. Um, the completeness of the search is determined by the time and scope constraint, and then it may include research in progress as well. So typically, they do include ongoing research in a scoping review. So there's probably no, there's not going to be any um, formal assessment of quality. Again, our headings are appraisal, synthesis, and analysis up here. Um, typically, you know, you'll see that narrative, um, some narrative commentary, and then the typical table that you would see in a systematic review. Um, and then the analysis characterizes the quantity and the quality of literature, perhaps by study design or some other key features and attempts to specify a viable review. And most of the time, uh, uh, not most of the time, but so, sometimes a scoping review is um, like your first step before a systematic review. So then I wanna kind of talk a, a little bit about these last three. So a systematic search and a review, this is, um, this is usually done it aims to, for the search itself, it aims to be exhaustive, comprehensive searching. And it typically addresses broad question, questions to produce the best evidence in the search. But it may or may not include a quality, quality um, assessment, minimal narrative and tabular information for the studies. Um, it's really a systematic search and review. So what happens is you're doing the search systematically and you're really writing like a critical review. And then the systematized review is typically what's done is a lot of times what we see in the med center. Um, these are typically conducted as a postgraduate student assignment. So it may or may not include a comprehensive searching. So the systematic review is exhaustive. It, it really aims to get all the evidence available. But your systematized review, you know, may or may not be comprehensive. Um, and it may or may not include a quality assessment. It's typically narrative with a tabular accompaniment um, with your with the results. And then you're looking at the analysis of what is known, the uncertainty around the findings, and the limitations of the methodology. You're gonna to want to say why this methodology is limited. And then in your umbrella review, um, this can have a couple of different names. So sometimes they're referred to as um, reviews of systematic reviews, overviews of reviews, reviews of reviews, a summary of systematic reviews, as also a synthesis of reviews. So it can, there's plenty of ways to say it. Um, it's a new type of review and its purpose is to compare, it's relatively new. Um, it's, Purpose is to compare and contrast published systematic reviews and to provide an overall summary of the literature available on a given topic. So an umbrella review provides an overall picture so that the merits of all the interventions or all the elements of the phenomenon can be better appreciated. That's sort of what an umbrella review is. So I hope that a little bit um, of this explaining of the different review types um, can kind of help you. And if you feel like your question doesn't lend itself to any of these review types, then you can also check out the, the other article that we shared at the very beginning, the 2009, the updated booth article, 2019 updated booth article, which could, which is the one with the 48 review types. And so maybe one of your question would lend itself to that or definitely consult with one of the librarians and they'd be happy to help you. So then this really um, handy dandy chart from Cornell, let me open this up. This is a really good chart to, um, let's see if it, well, I'm gonna stop sharing just for a second. So I want, I want to make sure that I'm sharing the right screen. So 
There we go. Yeah, I am. Sorry. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure I'm um, sharing the right screen here for you. I am seeing this in a little bit. Okay, there we go. So um, this kind of is a flow chart that will help you whenever you're deciding what kind of question or what type of review is right for you. So it asks you to start out asking you, do you want to gather all the evidence on a particular research topic? If you say, no, I don't want everything, then you just want to do an, a regular narrative review. If you do want everything, the next question is, do you have three or more people to work on the review? If you say no, then that's going to be kind of like a, a red flag. So for a systematic review, usually it's more than three people. You need the content expert, sometimes you need a statistician, you need some, an expert in the literature, um, literature section. You really need more, three or more people to work on the review. Lots of times you, you probably have a couple of content experts, but you have to uh, screen the article. You have to have it like a, a blind um, article screening. So if you say no, then what you probably want to do is, is go back to that chart and you're probably looking at a systematized review because that's the one where typically post grads do it um, for one a school for a project. So that's probably what you're going to want to do. So if you do say yes, do you have 12 to 18 months to complete the review? If you say nope, I don't have that much time, you're probably going to do a rapid review. If you say yes, then do you have a broad topic or multiple research questions? If you have a broad topic, then you're probably going to do a scoping review. If you have the, if you say no to that question, if you want to look at other published systematic reviews, if you say yes, you're probably going to want to just do an umbrella review. If you say no, then the next um, option is do you have a well formulated question? If you say no, you're, it's not it's not like you can't do a systematic review, but it's really important to um, have a well formulated research question. So, and the reason that you want to have this is because you want an unbiased, reproducible way to provide the evidence for practice and policy making, and to identify gaps in the research. So that requires a well formulated question. So typically we use the PICO framework, so patient intervention, case, and outcome. You might be familiar with that. However, that is not the only framework that you can use to create a well-formulated research question. There's lots of different frameworks that you that are out there. So if you do not know what they are, you can contact a librarian and we'd be happy to help you formulate your question to have a well-defined question. So then if you answered yes, then you would want to go ahead and do a systematic review. And then the next question is, are you going to use statistics to um, evaluate and synthesize the results? And if you say yes, then you're going to actually do a systematic review with a meta-analysis. And if you say no, then a meta-analysis is not needed. So this is a good, um, a good flow chart to just kind of get you in the right space to think about, um, you know, what kind of review am I wanting to do? And you know, what, how much time do I have? And you know, all of these questions that you have to do, what you have to think about when you're planning a review. <clears throat> all right, so now I'm going to go ahead and stop my share again and get my PowerPoint back up. Okay, so we already, we talked about the types of reviews. Now I want to just kind of throw this out there, and I feel like I've touched on it, but we want to make sure that we're, um, I want to just make sure that you all understand this. So the word systematic refers to an order in planning. So in the systematic review, there is a set of transparent, orderly, and structurally interrelated steps carried out in a way that avoids bias. So what is happening is that there's been a trend that has been identified and that it's 
is talked about in that 2019 Booth article that because of the influence of systematic, the systematic review model, it impacted other forms of literature reviews that are requiring um, that they be more systematic in their procedures, explicit in describing their methods and to the extent possible, reproducible to facilitate cons consolidation of knowledge. So sometimes we have students, um, most of the time it's students come in and say, I want to do a systematic review, but what they're really looking for is that they just want to be more systematic in their procedures. Um, and it's not necessarily a systematic review that they're wanting to do. It's a systematic search. It's, um, they want to be more systematic in their search process. So, and again, because of this influence of um, systematic reviews, because so many have been published over the years, um, it's an incredible number that has impacted the way that um, narrative reviews are seen. Um, and so what we're trying to do and what is typically what, um, so the articles that are getting published are the ones that are more systematic in their approach, not necessarily systematic reviews. All right. So now we're just kind of, I wanna take a few minutes and go over um, the next few slides that distinguish between a systematic review and a scoping review. These are the ones that we see a lot. Uh, this is the time some of your questions that are um, that are coming in, they're more of a broad research question and they're not that super focused, um, you know, framework question. Um, that is really what you need for a systematic review. So systematic review, precise questions work best. So for example, this is a really good systematic review question. So what is the effectiveness of the Gardasil vaccine compared with the Cerevac vaccine in preventing human pamphlema virus infection in adolescents and young women? So that is a good focused research question. So for a scoping review, that those are broader questions. So a good scoping review question may be, what types of neurological interventions, oh, I'm sorry, what types of neurological reactions to the human pamphlema vaccine have been reported? So that's a much broader question. And so um, systematic reviews there, the objective is to summarize the evidence based on inclusion and exclusion criteria determined a priori, which means before the protocol. So you have to determine all of that criteria, the inclusion and exclusion before the protocol, or before the search, before you, um, sorry, <laughs> I don't wanna confuse anyone. So you have to write that in your protocol before you do the search. But then whenever you're looking at um, scoping reviews, the inclusion criteria can be created during the screening process. So that's a big difference between um, the scoping reviews and systematic reviews. Your, all of your inclusion and exclusion criteria has to be determined before searching in a systematic review, and it can be determined, the inclusion criteria can be determined um, based upon the results that you're, that you're seeing when you're screening. Um, systematic reviews typically exclude or include evidence based on study design. They always include a quality assessment and then they synthesize and aggregate the findings. In a scoping review, it doesn't always include a quality assessment and then the chart um, charts data according to key issues and themes, and then they rely on evidence from multiple study designs. So that's kind of the, the big differences between the two. And then the like, indication for a systematic review would be to uncover the international evidence, um, confirm current practices, address any variations or identify new practices, identify and inform areas for future research, 
identify or investigate conflicting information or results and produce statements to guide the decision making. Yeah, where systematic reviews are, again, look, thinking back to that evidence-based pyramid, they're at the top of the pyramid, and that's what the information that we rely on to make um, healthcare decisions and inform practice changes. And so scoping reviews are um, intended to identify the types of available evidence in a given field, to clarify key concepts or definitions in the literature, to examine how research is conducted on a certain topic or field, to identify key characteristics or factors related to a concept. Sometimes there are precursors to a systematic review, and then um, to identify and analyze knowledge gaps. So systematic and scoping reviews require a methodologically rigorous approach. So your methodology is very rigorous and you must create a protocol with both systematic reviews and scoping reviews. And a protocol is pretty much a plan and there's plenty of guidance um, for those plans or protocols. And there's a definite protocol driven approach to the information retrieval. So in the protocol, um, in the protocol checklist, there is a you know it states how many databases you search, um, what you need to do, include synonyms for keywords, include Boolean operators, include citation. There's a lot of information that goes on. Um, a lot of information is out there in this checklist, and there's um, the, the standards and the guidance to help inform you of how to do this review. So uh, again, the systematic review methods guidance and also scoping review is found um, on the systematic review steps page. We've kind of looked at that a little bit earlier. So if you go to the click on the systematic review steps and then you click on um, under developer research questions, these standards and guidelines um, are available for you. And then under this protocol link here, there's a protocol for a systematic review, a scoping review, the PISMA, which is the most common um, checklist available, that is linked in there as well. So why protocols? Um, the systematic and scoping reviews to be useful, they need to be reported in the highest possible quality thus facilitating their accurate use across a wide spectrum of stakeholders, including patients. So the gold standard for identifying and reporting biases is comparison of the completed review paired with its protocol. So this is difficult with systematic reviews as too few of them report working with from a protocol, although a growing number of funders now require that. If you wanna read more about it, there's a link in the references to um, a systematic review journal. And that um, there's more information that you can find in the references about that. So some of the protocol reporting guidelines for systematic reviews, there's this, um, the Cochrane TH group guide for developing a Cochrane protocol. Cochrane is like the highest level of protocol um, of uh, the most rigorous and highest level of systematic reviews. Um, there's the, then there's the PRISMA reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So the PRISMA T, um, which is standard, that's the one that most people use. And then you can register protocols on Prospero, which is an international registry for protocols. And then if you publish your protocol, um, you can publish them in like BMJ, BMJ Open or other journals that um, ha that accept protocol publications. OSF will let you um, publish your protocol. It will also let you register your protocol in there as well. Um, for scoping reviews, you use the Prisma P or and or the Prisma um, scoping review checklist. Um, to help guide your protocol. So again, this is not, you know, it's not like there's nothing out there to help you along in the process of creating your protocol. There's a lot of guidance 
Um, again, those can be found on the systematic review guide, but if you definitely, if you have questions, you can definitely contact um, one of the medical librarians. So how can we help you? <laughs> What can the librarians do to help you? So I've talked about, I feel like I've talked about <laughs> us enough in, throughout this presentation, but just to reiterate that we can, we're available to consult with you. Um, ideally, before you start the project, you know, it's kind of difficult if you've already done the search and you've already written up your results and you contact us then. So it, it, the earliest possible time um, would be ideal. And then we can help you determine the best review type for your question. We can also provide you with a literature um, literature help, uh, you know, databases, suggest databases to search in, um, review syntax, um, search syntax, um, provide suggestions for subject heading, things like that. And I will say that um, studies. There's been a lot of studies that have shown that librarian involvement in a systematic review improves the quality and reproducibility of the search. So, we can also help with the searching process. And um, I'm talking about like precision and sensitivity when I say that. So, imagine that this image represents all the literature in the world. And so the green squares represent all the relevant literature that answers the topic. And then the red dots represent all the irrelevant literature. Okay. So you can do a very precise search, which is indicated by this green circle here, but you're gonna miss out a lot of the literature a lot of other relevant information. But then you can do a very sensitive search, which is this purple circle here, to capture all of the literature, but then you're gonna to have to sift through a lot of irrelevant literature on your topic. So we can help you with this process. We can help you with the balance of the sensitivity and the precision. So your question might be super specific and can be searched precisely. So for example, like a drug dosing question, research questions need to be searched more sensitively. So if your objective is to, if, if you only need a few of recent randomized controlled trials on a topic, that's different than if you're doing a systematic review. So Searching kind of is a, um, you know, you're going to balance your, the pre, the balance is predetermined by your question and your objective. So it's a lot of trial and error. <laughs> and using the tools and the mechanics of the database effectively is something that we're experts in. Um, and then you have to be patient and think about critically about your results. So there's a, there's a lot of um, <laughs> balance to be had. So another um, way that we can help and another kind of illustration is, you know, say you hit the bullseye. That's great. <laughs> you found a couple of relevant articles right away. Now it's time to expand the search and make sure you don't miss anything. So you need to add synonyms to your concepts. You need to use the tools the database um, of the databases to expand your keyword searches. You need to consider eliminating any concepts that are over limiting your results. So for example, if your population is patients with cancer taking chemotherapy, you don't need to search the cancer and chemotherapy, it's redundant. Most people on chemotherapy have cancer. So if you miss, you're getting way too much information. So just try rethinking your question. If it's too broad, you know, what are the other causes of cancer, adding another concept or removing some search terms that could be um, making the results go astray. Um, AIDS will find articles on both AIDS, but also things about, you know, aid. So you want, um, you might need to use a narrow subject heading. 
rest of the outer bowl, this is really where you're, you know, that this is where you want your search results to be. So a good search will always have a mix of irrelevant and relevant hits. So if you're only getting relevant hits, you're doing it wrong. So look for about a 50-50 split and you need to feel good that you've captured a good breadth of the literature on your topic, developing a search strategy that is iterative, hitting the right spots and taking a few tries and lots of practice. So this is the, I don't know, I feel like we've talked a little bit, a lot today about um, the systematic reviews and scoping reviews and other types of reviews. And I feel like you have a good grasp of the different types of review designs and a good grasp of how the medical center can help you in your search needs. And whether you're trying to just do a literature search or you're just trying, um, or you really need help um, with that more systematic review. So I want to point out the systematic review research guide. That's always available for you. You can email us at mtlid at uky.edu. That's our NICLIB reference email. If you email that, it will get filtered to the correct person. You can use the um, literature search request on the, um, on the medical library's homepage if you're just needing a literature search done. And then there's that consult on the systematic review guide if you really think that you might wanna undertake a systematic review, or even if it's a different review and you're not quite sure, you can use that guide as well. And then there's our website link available for you as well. So again, I wanna thank you for coming today and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have.